prevent those obstacles from, from really obscuring your path. So that's, that's why, in case you ever wondered, why, why do we chant or what is this whole deal about the mala beads? That's what that's about. And then we're gonna switch into the section of the four locks and keys, which is always one of my favorites, um, one of my favorite teachings in the Yoga Sutras. And think of these also, the locks. So think of, I want you to think of when they talk about the locks, what they're talking about is your heart locking up. And it's in relation to relating to other people. And so you might, so they list four of them. So these four um, ways that you might relate to other people. And then, and some of them, maybe not all of them, cause your heart to lock up. And so this book, these teachings, they're providing you the key to unlock your own heart. So I've heard some teachers describe it and it's the lock to the other person's heart, but I think it's the lock to your own heart. Um, and just when you think of certain personalities that trigger you and how you just kind of go, you're all locked up here. Well, how do, how do you keep your heart open? So the first one is, um, is happiness. And you might not think of happiness as something that would bother you. But if you can go back in your life and think about somebody else's happiness bothering you, like watching somebody else um, have something fantastic come to them. And if you can think of social media, <laughs> you know, you see these people on social media and oh my gosh, it looks like everything is so awesome in their life. And it makes you feel like, wow, my life isn't so good. There ever, if you could ever go back to a time when you felt that or, or another example might be you're a shy person and you've either entered into a new club or maybe back when you're in high school, a new school and you're shy and you see these people happy and they've been friends for a long time and they're doing all these fun things, they're happy and it makes you feel bad to see that happiness. So the key to that, if you've experienced that, if you can relate to that, is friendliness. So you be, you're friendly, you are friendly to those people who are happy that instead of kind of, they make me feel bad, I'm just not even gonna go there, you're friendly to them. And then if you're friendly to people who are happy, you might end up in that orbit, that orbit of these happy people. And if you, believe, and I do believe, things rub off on you. Wherever you place yourself, wherever you put yourself in the path, that runs, rubs off on you. So if you're putting yourself in the path of people and you're, you're pointing your direction towards happy people and happiness, it, it just might rub off on you. Versus, you know, and there, there is that tendency of like, well, I feel bad when I'm around these people who are just always happy because I'm not so happy myself. So I'm gonna hang around these other people who also have a lot of stuff to complain about and aren't that happy. Well, that's just gonna rub off on you too. That's the idea of that. And then that brings up the next one, which is unhappiness. And how does that make you feel when you're around people who are unhappy? For me, that one's a real trigger. <laughs> and, um, well, the many examples that I can come up with in my life, and I, I've explained this to my to my loved ones. And so, I don't have to hang around with any unhappy people out there in the world. I'm not going to go seek them out, but occasionally there are going to be people in your life who are your family members, who are your loved ones. And here we are coming around to the holidays. And what about? And I don't know if you're going to actually be able to see your family or not. But you know, think about those holidays where you come together as a family and there's the one person who's always complaining and, and do you sit and listen or do you kind of find yourself <laughs> wanting to move away? Um, in my life, I know that I've been, even before I read this, I was given a message from the universe that <clears throat> I need to practice this. I need to practice compassion. That's the, that's the key to people who are unhappy. And so the people who are in your life, who are complaining, 
And whether that, you know, however that makes you feel. And for me, I know that it kind of makes me feel to just take a, for me, the practice is take a breath and remember, this is what I need to work on. I need to work on being more compassionate and sitting and listening. Let's see what the book has to say about these two. So um, I'm gonna go back to friendliness, see what the book has to say. Sri Patanjali recommends cultivating friendliness towards the happy as the key to understanding calmness. We should make friends with happiness, get to know it, give it proper attention and respect. If we dwell on happiness, looking for it, like a miner's eye seeks gold, we will cultivate it in our lives. And then unhappiness, a compassionate heart is a comfort and support to many. We develop compassion by recalling acts of kindness that have benefited us while remembering the pain, alienation, despair, and confusion caused by suffering. And so the next one is, um, they say virtuous. And when I think of virtuous, I also wanna think of really talented people or people who are being celebrated in some way, who've risen to the top. Um, and so it's kind of a human tendency to be jealous or compare yourself to that person. Um, and those qualities of being jealous or comparing, that's, that's, that's going to be an obstacle to your happiness. So it's something to, it's a practice, but the key to that is to delight, delight in somebody's happiness, delight in other people's success, whether it's a friend of yours or someone who's not a friend of yours, but really honoring, honoring and uh, celebrating people's good fortune and also people's, you know, amazing talents. And I think, I think in the workplace, when I used to have like a corporate job and such, I always thought it was interesting how, how seldom people would say at a board meeting, um, really make a point to say their appreciation for somebody else's work, you know? Um, and I think celebrating other people and their talents and their successes is really important. Um, what the book has to say about this is virtues can be developed through study and contemplation, or as the sutra suggests, through recognizing their presence in others. In other words, we should cultivate the habit of celebrating virtues whenever we recognize them. The more we rejoice in them, they will be ours. I found it kind of sad when, when I was young, I danced a lot. And, and the dance, it just felt so good to do. It was almost a sacred thing for me. Um, and usually we would be in a performance and it would be something that we were all doing together. Um, and then my daughter, when she got into dance, and I've said this for those of you who've been on these yoga sutra calls before, you might have heard this before, but my daughter, the almost all the dance studios, they had competitive dance. So all of the dances were a competition and one person won and then there was second place. There, these poor girls, it's like, this is supposed to bring joy to their bodies and joy to their minds and their hearts. And yet they were being judged. I thought that was too bad. So I think of that whenever I read this third one. And then the last one is, I now I remember we talked a little bit about this term, it's the non-virtuous. So what do you do when you're confronted with those people? Those people that are just bad people doing bad things. And as polarized as we are right now, um, probably turn on the news <laughs> and feel like you see some of those people. And the way to deal with this is equanimity. And equanimity is an interesting word. It doesn't mean, I don't think it means being dispassionate or not caring or not paying attention to it or being apathetic. I think instead it's for being able to see things as they are and really understanding this idea that um, 
when you take the bigger picture, like sort of step back and take a bigger picture, there have been awful things and injustices going on since the beginning of time in different parts of the world. And so it's our job, if they happen to be happening in our world right now, it's our job to not contribute to them and not get knocked sideways so much that, you know, to be in such despair because it's happening, because it is happening. It, you know, there are gonna be bad people out there doing bad things, but to be able to be grounded enough and level-headed enough to be able to speak up against it, to um, continue to point yourself in the direction of where your values, your actions align with your values. And you have to kind of be calm in the mind to be able to do that. So recognizing it, seeing it, being a, an observer, and also showing up showing up in whatever way you can to right injustices. So let's see what, what uh, this translation has to say about it. Sad to say we all too often witness or are victims of injustices. Even though anger often feels justifiable and sometimes seems like the best way to connect an injustice, Sri Patanjali doesn't find it to be an acceptable attitude for a yogi. Instead, we are challenged to do something that may seem counterintuitive when we face a non-virtuous act, and that is to keep our equanimity. So, hmm, I'm gonna just read a little bit more. This is where he talks about anger. And you know, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned it here, but I was thinking of it when I was talking about um, when I was around my father and he was very unhappy for many years at the end of his life, his health was not good. And he, he even expected like other people's happiness, my mom's happiness, and they were together for 50 years. And um, my mom's happiness really bothered him. It made him unhappy. He kind of expected her life to stop just because his life had to be altered dramatically. And, and when I would see that response, and again, I was not very compassionate. When I would see that response towards my mom, I would get angry. And uh, that, is when, that is when I really got this message toward, I need to be more compassionate to my dad. And, and I, I love this passage in this book about anger. So I'm gonna read it. Though it's natural to feel like striking back when we are victims and someone's wrong, anger causes great harm it deprives us of peace and neutrality of mind our bodies become shaky and disturbed anger weakens us physically anger destroys reason and stifles creativity the loss of reason and creativity means that better approaches to resolving conflicts are often missed every act of anger predispos predisposes us to further instances Repeated actions create habits and habits continue to form characters. We are in danger of becoming bitter people. Our anger hurts us first. And it says the mind possessed of equanimity is in the best position to find solutions. It is strong, clear, and free of biases. We don't need anger to motivate us to do what is right. We can act from higher motives, compassion, the clear knowledge of what is right, and the strong wish to bring about harmony. With clarity of mind, we will understand the wicked acts and its implications. Increasingly, the chances of finding creative and effective solutions will be found with the mind that is full of equanimity. Yeah, so four locks and four keys. And you know, maybe they're not all triggers to you, but let's just take a moment to close our eyes and reflect on 
the ones that are. And I'll repeat them again. The key to happiness when that's a trigger is friendliness. The key to unhappiness when that is a trigger is compassion. And the key to virtuous, talented people is to delight in their virtues and their talents. And then the non-virtuous, the key there is equanimity. And so I guess when you, like Tiffany and I were talking when we just uh, logged on first and you know, when the news is disturbing to you, there are a lot of tips and tricks in here. And so just whatever you have to do to calm your mind. And if you can't think of anything, maybe the mantra chanting, you can even start with something like as simple as Om or another phrase that, um, that calms you. And it can be in English or it can be something you've heard in a class, or you can even Google all of these things. You can Google mantras for calming the mind and, um, and just repeat them over and over. Find a quiet place to sit. And if you have some beads, and again, I said in my thing, you know, they can be mala beads, 108, or any beads. If you had any beads, you can just, it's something to do with your hands too. And so, I guess we'll end with the mantra, Om Namah Shivaya. And let's go ahead and say that to ourselves. I've got you guys muted, so I can't hear you, but uh, say that to ourselves. Let's just go around five times. So maybe close your eyes, get comfortable, breathe. And then Om Namah Shivaya. 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 And that phrase, as it's used in, in uh, a part of the world, um, often is, uh, I will accept what is to come. And um, it's kind of like, whatever will be, will be. Okay, I'm gonna unmute you guys and love to just take a moment and say, hey, how have you been doing? I'm curious, Karen, I'd love to ask you, uh, I'd love to ask you what's going on in that part of the world. We've now gotten this situation here where stuff is getting a little more closed. We've gone from, I guess we're, we're in red now, but all the counties surrounding us are in purple. I don't know if that means anything out there in Kansas. Um, we're, uh, it's really bad out here. Uh, as far as COVID goes. In fact, I was telling Susan, I was talking to Susan before we um, logged on. Uh, I was uh, exposed to COVID on Friday and uh, I'm waiting my results. I don't think I have it, but you know, I, who knows? And I, I got it. Maybe the reason I got the test is I had injured myself when I first got here and the doctor suggested that I do like a hot, um, gentle yoga. And so the studio I go to, it was great because they only had six, they only allow six people and we're all masked, mm -hmm. but the teacher had it. So, but you know, I was telling Susan too, I don't, you know, even if I have it, I, I could have gotten it at the grocery store. There's so many people out here that don't uh, think that it's anything. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of scary. You know, I had just moved into this house last week and Friday, I had probably 15, 16 guys in here doing different work and all of them were really great about wearing masks, but two of them came in here and I said, could you please wear a mask? And he's, oh, I don't believe in that shit, you know? 
and and I said and I just tried to stay away from them but they're in my space you know <laughs> well you and, could insist it's your home but I know how that's awkward I had the same experience when I was in Oregon and I went up there and check on my place and there was stuff that was supposed to be done that wasn't done. So I was trying to get contractors there right away. They were doing me a favor. They came without masks. Nobody had, nobody came in with a mask. Right when I was left, right after I left, they, um, that whole state went on lockdown. So. I think we're going to go on lockdown again. Yeah. That's what I hear until um, March. But in your yoga class, you and the teacher had masks on? I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they only allow six people. So they close it at six people. That's, you um, know, so. Do you yeah. have any symptoms? I have no symptoms. I feel great. But, you know, I could have it still. And I'm caring for my mom, who's 86. So I'm just super careful. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's so different out here because they're so opened up. You know, I went to my first restaurant um, since February. I went to two restaurants and it, I felt like I was just on some great vacation being in a restaurant, but now I won't go. Yeah. I'm not going to go anymore. It's, it's getting really bad out here. Mm. In fact, I was telling Susan, I'm going to tell my kids I booked them for Christmas, but I'm going to tell them not to come. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, okay. Yeah you got to wait it out. You know, that's the way I feel, but it's amazing that many, many people just think, Oh, if I get it, it's just like a cold. Yeah. You well, know. everybody's got a different reaction and, and, and the holidays are coming and, um, you know, going to be hard for a lot of people yeah. either way, not seeing their family. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I get, I, I, I am glad I get to see you guys on Zoom in this way and um, seeing some of you in, you know, the yoga classes that I'm doing are very, very empty <laughs> and a lot of space. Are you guys um, practicing now in, in the studios there? Um, so yeah, I went, I, we just, I just started teaching back and it went from 25% to 10%. Mm -hmm. um, now I see Manny at, uh, at Rolling Hills and that's outside on tennis courts and everybody's spaced, I would say more than six feet apart. What would you say, Manny? Yeah, it's very- Yeah, it, it, yeah at least six feet, usually nine. Yeah, so that feels safe. And then the yoga studios that I teach at, Meta is really high ceilings and it's like a loft. So there's this, all this space and very, very,